Hello and welcome to the Aviation Briefing with me, William Hallowell. In this podcast, I speak to industry and media colleagues about the biggest stories in the aviation industry. And today I'm joined by Simon Calder, the travel correspondent for The Independent, to talk about the Japanese airline crash that happened in Tokyo earlier this week. Hello, Simon. Uh, yes, and good to talk to you about something which was, of course, a profound tragedy in that three, five members of the uh, Japanese Coast Guard lost their lives, but it could have been, as we, I think, all can see, much, much worse. So you've been covering this story quite a lot. Um, could you give us a kind of brief overview of what's happened so far this week and where we are at today in terms of updates with the investigation uh, so far into the cause of, of the accident? So this was happening on Tuesday, the 2nd of January, uh, early evening in Tokyo, a Japan Airlines routine flight from Chitose in uh, in the north of Japan to Haneda, the main uh, Japanese airport in Tokyo. And it was coming into land absolutely as normal, cleared to land. Um, it uh, struck this much smaller Dash 8 aircraft um, on the runway, uh, burst into flames, um, came to a halt uh, some, some way down the runway, uh, whereupon there was a successful evacuation of all 379 people um, on board. A remarkable story. Meanwhile, the captain of the Dash 8 survived, but uh, his five colleagues did not, very sadly. So shocking scenes and interesting to get that those images of course on live tv of an an aircraft in flames the sheer horror of it makes you think oh i'm watching a film this can't be real life but then when you realize it is then of course your concern is for the people on board and uh, they managed to escape a, a remarkable testament to aviation professionalism and the good work of the passengers as well rather than a term banded around in the uh the, in, in the media which is miracle yes absolutely um so in terms of you know where we're at in terms of the investigation um yesterday after some speculation um it was reported that um in fact the dash eight uh aircraft had not been given permission by air traffic control to enter the runway at the time of the collision um as the authorities say you know the investigation's still going on but is it jumping the gun to suggest that this is the main cause or you know can we expect more information to come out you know are there other factors I, i'm not an aviation safety professional and i know that the investigators who are coming from you know, not just the Japanese authorities, Japan Airlines, but uh, the French um, or, or, uh, investigation branch, the uh, makers, of course, Airbus, uh, I think the British have sent a delegation out there just to see what can be learned. However, um, talking to pilots, it appears that the general conclusion is that the uh, Dash 8, um, which was carrying earthquake uh, supplies, relief supplies, and therefore um, certainly in a hurry from humanitarian point of view, uh, appears to have um, failed to hold short of the runway, which it was instructed to do, um, and instead lined up and somehow uh, during all of this failed to notice there was a very large aircraft coming into land exactly where it was. So a uh, terrible tragedy. We will learn clearly from it, but uh, that appears to be the, um, the the conclusion that this was um, pilot error, not the first of this kind, and um, I fear probably not the last either. Yes, there have been a lot of reports that, you know, uh, it is down to the, you know, pilot error, but we've also been hearing that local police in the area uh, are you know, potentially investigating some professional um, malpractice. So as you say, you know, it is a tragedy and it was on the way to um, provide relief and help uh, following the earthquakes. But that's actually quite a serious um, thing to be investigating, isn't it? Professional malpractice. I mean, could we suggest that it was in fact um, a poor accident or was it, you know, potentially the opposite? Was it actually a serious, you know, error of judgment that could land a pilot potentially in, in some trouble? 
Well, um, I am not familiar with the uh, Japanese judicial system um, or the uh, 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 proof that, that that they need in order to um, uh, to, to prosecute somebody. Um, I, I would simply say that it's a, a a situation where for an accident like this to happen, you need a whole lot of things to line up. The so-called Swiss cheese model um, that used to, to talk about uh, aviation security. In other words, if you if all the holes line up, then you have an accident uh, and potentially loss of life. Talking to pilots, the um, what they're saying is, of course, there's two parties to this. There, there, there appears to be uh, a, a smaller propeller aircraft going onto the runway when it wasn't supposed to. So why wasn't that spotted by the pilots of the Airbus A350? And it appears that if you're flying into that very, very busy airport, there's an awful lot of lights around, you will not necessarily uh notice immediately that there's uh, uh, uh lights coming from an aircraft which is on the runway you're on partly because you're a pilot your every your full experience tells you that this doesn't happen because you've been cleared to land and therefore you can assume that the runway is clear uh there will be questions to be answered about um uh the ground radar and about why the apparent disobedience of a command wasn't immediately picked up and we will learn from that but uh, uh, beyond that i i'm not sure as i say what what legal um things might happen i would be unhappy if anything uh moved against the general principle that aviation actors accidents are there to be learned from uh not to simply a portion of blame and therefore that uh, uh, everyone is as open as they can be in order to uh, reduce the risk of a repeat. And in terms of um, repercussions, not just for Japan Airlines, but uh, the wider industry, I know you've kind of mentioned about, you know, safety standards. And it was, you know, the Independent Today I saw that reported that the airline said that, you know, they're looking at potentially losing $100 million um, in operating uh, losses. Um you know how how will that affect the the airline going forward it is extraordinary that we should be talking here about a an airline possibly losing money because its uh, crew have demonstrated enormous professionalism um yes i can see if you are an anxious flyer and you see images of an aircraft coming down a runway in flames of the it, very, very furious fire that that burnt of the remains, the charred remains of of, of the aircraft uh, on the ground at uh, Haneda Airport. You're going to think, oh, flying's dangerous. Don't fancy that. As opposed to the rational conclusion, which is flying is safe, even when you have a situation like this, which it looks absolutely awful and unsalvageable. Everyone on the passenger aircraft can leave successfully. So, uh, yeah, Japan Airlines does some things saying, you know, we'll, we'll, if you book to travel in the next couple of months, we'll give you a full refund if you want one. Um, I, I guess there will be people who will appreciate that gesture. I think it's unnecessary and um, I'm doing all I can to persuade people. This is, you know, it was a tragedy, but it is something which people should take comfort from because of the uh, incredible uh, success of the evacuation. So you said earlier, you know, it, it's about lessons learned as opposed to um, dishing out blame. Um, what can we see in terms of um, the lessons that we learn uh, for aviation? You know, could, could we be talking about um, newer safety protocols? As you said, you know, there have been many um, aviation uh, commentators and experts who have praised the crew for their evacuation drills um what what can we expect to see coming out on on that end in terms of safety procedures well uh, of course the pilot community will be looking at this and thinking okay how do we how do we um use and i i'd use that term advisedly how do we use this to boost safety on our aircraft and i imagine that 
but they will individually be formulating ways of saying uh, effectively you know what can happen so please pay attention to uh, what we are uh, to, to the safety demonstration and make sure you fully understand it and particularly pay attention to the bit about not taking any cabin baggage with you um the uh, for, from a kind of airline level perspective i think there will be more focus on the uh, on, on the safety briefing um and of course you've got a cabin crew who have been watching this who um will now be kind of understanding i know they train very very rigorously for emergencies like this probably you know, it is the the most single important piece of training that they do and i hope that they will be obviously recognizing that that, that this is a really important thing to do and again perhaps you know because you you and i know you get onto an aircraft there you are you're you're um uh the safety briefing comes on it's the 20th you've heard that year you're not really focusing you're looking out the window you're playing with your phone or whatever no you you need to be attentive to what they're telling you you need to know where the exits are you need to know what to do in an emergency so i hope it's this is a kind of reset and people will be more respectful to cabin crew and i think it's really quite um rude if if somebody a, a professional is describing to you how to save lives if you are just sort of thinking oh, no, no, i've heard this before and and get on with reading the paper it's not um uh you, you you've got to pay your part i suppose that is you know that's a, actually a really important point that you raise especially you know over summer i know you know brits abroad they have quite a, a reputation at the moment especially you know with passengers getting drunk in the airport on mm. the way to their their holidays and then you know you know, poor behavior on the plane. So um, that is obviously a very important point. Um, one thing I would like to go back to is the the five people who who sadly died, um, who were part of the Coast Guard crew. Uh, do we know anything about them? Uh, any, you know, kind of background information, any, you know, personal stories or, because I know we've got their names now, um, but uh, are, are we aware of any other reports? It's not something that I have focused on. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very much uh, focused on, on, as it were, passenger aviation. This was a terrible tragedy, and my thoughts are with their loved ones. But ultimately, um, it is uh, a, 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 I, I, I know. I'm afraid to say nothing about of their personal circumstances, but it is, of course. Um, a, a devastating thing to have happened and uh, uh, I think we all feel great great sorrow about that um, and can I just go back actually something you were mentioning about the um, about uh, alcohol and drinking on planes I think this could actually be a very valuable uh, time at which um, airlines are more uh, vigilant about alcohol on aircraft I know that they um, that the, particularly the um, budget airlines serving the UK tend to be um, you know, very, very uh, careful of watching this. But you do not want to be stuck behind somebody who is incapable of following the instructions because they are drunk. And I think more rigorous um, enforcement of the existing rules would be a very good thing to enhance passenger safety and obviously make flights a lot more pleasant as well so yeah i think we're some way from having no alcohol flights in the same way that we have no smoking flights but uh uh if we move the dial towards more sobriety i think that would be a good thing well i know that's certainly something that people are you know campaigning for you know in a legislative sense they're calling on the government to actually enforce that you know with uh, legislation um but going back to the investigation again um what do you think we can expect to find out in in the coming days perhaps weeks um you know as the investigation continues uh, with japanese authorities and as you say um airbus specialists have been deployed there as well to assist obviously it was an airbus 350 that was involved in the crash there is nothing as 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 forensic as an aviation accident investigation and they will be rigorous about uh, 
talking to everybody involved, getting all the data from the radar, from the uh, voice recorders and so on, um, to find out exactly what happened. And that is great. And probably in a year from now, we'll have the comprehensive report, the final report. But in the meantime, I think we will have a an interim report pretty quickly, um, which I speculate here, and that's all it is. I speculate we'll say somehow this small aircraft turned onto the runway and it should not have done and that led to this uh, awful uh, sequence of events. This tragedy occurred the day after the end of the safest year ever on record for aviation, with fewer crashes, fewer fatalities than ever before. Sadly, there were two fatal accidents involving passenger aircraft, both of them uh, involving uh, passenger propeller aircraft on domestic flights. No fatalities at all. Um, and no uh, no international flights, uh, so no passenger jets involved, no international flights involved. That is a testament to the immense professionalism of the men and women who keep us safe. That was Simon Calder, travel correspondent for The Independent, giving us some insights into where we're at now with the uh, investigation into the Japan Airlines crash that occurred at Haneda Airport in Tokyo. Thank you very much for listening. I've been William Hallowell for the Aviation Briefing.